Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Open Book. Isn't it lovely to be able to say that? <laughs> welcome to Open Book at the Fugard. Uh, even better to be able to say that. Uh, may have changed names, but at least we're still in this beautiful venue. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you today P. Pacifique Kabalira Uwase from Rwanda, now living in Bloemfontein of all places, and uh, we may have to ask him about that. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce to you a young boy who witnessed some of the most terrible atrocities of the modern age. I'd like to introduce to you a young man who endured the complexities of post-genocide Rwanda, a refugee who came to South Africa, worked as a car guard to survive, whose official document from our beloved Home Affairs was a handwritten piece of paper with a date stamp on it, a recipient of the Mandela Road Scholarship, a physics graduate, a businessman who started his own business consultancy firm, and now the author of this challenging book, Witnessing. And also, coming out of my discussions before we started with P, an, an exile, someone who is not going to be returning home anytime soon. And we're going to explore a little bit of that as well, because I think what you will hear tonight, I hope what you will hear tonight, will change your perspectives on some of the narratives that are accepted, or generally accepted, in Western media, Western um, funding, the Western funding narrative of Rwanda. Um, I think you will find some challenging questions being raised tonight. I certainly hope so. P, welcome. Welcome to Open Book. Lovely to have you here. I want to start with actually at the end and not at the beginning. I want to start with the writing process. I want to start with how you came to write this book. You say in the book that what you are doing is placing your story on an al altar. What, I love that image. As a writer, I love that image, and I take certain things from that image. But what, do you, what are you giving with that image? What do you mean that you're placing your story on an altar? Mm. Um, beautiful question. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, so <clears throat> for a long time uh, after the, the seed of the book was planted, uh, we are talking about 2006, hmm. um, I, I, I resisted writing the book and uh, uh, because a part of me didn't want to relive what I had lived through. In fact, I had actively sought to forget and to run away from that. Um, and, and so thinking of writing would mean I'm going to remember, I'm going to write and I'm going to find the right words. And mm -hmm. So it, it felt like it's going to be a painful process. Eventually, I found the courage to do that. Uh, um, we'll probably get uh, to talk to some of, some of the events that, that really freed me. Uh, and, and then my mind shifted to something else, which is people don't want to be reading this. Mm. This is not a story to share with people. Mm. And, I, and, and I was thinking that it's not a story worth telling. Uh, and so uh, uh, then there is the other part that I don't know how it's going to be received, not mm. just in the world, but in Rwanda, uh, there are some attention that I didn't want on me. Uh, and, and, and so there were many factors that, uh, when combined, made me resistant to writing the book. Uh, and then I decided, you know, I'm going to write it for me. So the first version of the book was actually in the present, in first person. I am here, I'm doing this. I wrote it as a journal. Uh, and then uh, after about 700 pages, uh, 
uh, I gave it to uh, uh, an editor. Some of uh, you might know Smallhorn, Mandy Smallhorn. I don't know if anybody knows Mandy Smallhorn. And she had the courage to tell me, if you are really doing this for you, I think, I think you should do it again. <laughs> You know, I was, I, I was, we were in Melville having coffee, but I, I've, I, I felt a jolt of anger. I'm thinking, I don't understand you know what you are asking, I don't think you know what you are asking me to do. Um, but she, she, in time, it, she was right. I, I got, at some point I went back to it and then I wrote a whole paragraph in the past and for the first time, I thought, oh, I can now go back to the beginning and write it as a story in the past. That was the first step that I thought, I can do this. Mm. And then eventually, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to give it. Uh, so, so, so I don't know what it is going to become. I don't know how people are going to respond to it. I don't know what kind of attention it's going to. It has already done what I needed it to do for me. And now I think it's time to let it go. And the altar was, I think, the most um, fitting place. Uh, I, I, I have to say it's not my words. Mm. Uh, it's a friend of mine uh, who, who was helping me to process my whole journey and said, you know, when you let it go, it's like you are just placing it on the altar and mm. then and then it becomes what it becomes. Mm. And so I borrowed those words because it just so fitted for me. For me, that image evokes trust. You have to put it out there, and to some extent you have to trust. You have to trust your readership, that they will understand. Mm. You need to trust your editor and your publisher that they have understood and have put a product out there mm. that will be understood by others. You have to trust that you've done justice to your story. Mm. But there's a huge amount of trust in placing it on, on the altar. Mm. And I hear all of your ambivalence and your hesitancy about whether this is a story you should, in fact, put on the altar. What then amazes me even more is the extraordinary honesty. You make yourself very, very vulnerable in this book. Mm. Um, I know things about you from this book that I would struggle to know about myself. Such is, the, such is the honesty that you have put out there. Is that about you talking to yourself? Is that because you are telling others about yourself? What, what's the motivation, well, what motivated that level of honesty about yourself in the book? Mm. Um, so some of the events that have helped me to release myself and, and, and go completely uh, free uh, with it. There are s some of them, there were experiences like one that I described where nothing mattered and everything mattered at the same time. There's, there's a chapter where mm. I'm actually talking about somebody helping me to process one of the memories, it was, it was Briggy. Um, in a training that absolutely had nothing to do with what she was doing with me. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and when she saw the opportunity, because she's so trained, she said, let's trust me, let's do something with it. Mm. Uh, and, and at the end of that process, I was lying on the floor, opened my eyes and then there's sweat and tears and, and snot. And, mm -hmm. and I opened my eyes and I saw other people looking at me from above. And I, I cannot describe that feeling. Mm. It's, it was free of fear, full of love and joy. And in, 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 in writing the chapter, in fact, I, I, I wasn't sure whether I'm bringing the reader in the room because I was not in the room. I was in the process. Because you know, other people who were participants, they were in the room, they were observing what mm. was happening, mm. but I was in the process. Mm. Uh, so like that moment, every time I went back to it, I remembered the joy and the freedom in it. And I thought, 
it is through the pain that I go to this freedom. Mm -hmm. And so everything that I have shared in, 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 in the book, I felt free. I felt free to do that. But key, really key, my intention was, this is our humanity. Yeah. This is all, you know, there is a part of our humanity that is delightful, that is yeah. wonderful, and it's yeah. part of our humanity that is it's not, not <laughs> right? Yeah. But I got to a point where I wanted to embrace it all. Mm. And so that's the whole point, is mm. I'm being faithful to my humanity in all its, its glory. Mm. And so letting it out there. I think for me, reading a story about such a difficult, traumatic time, if I had a sense that you were hiding your emotions, hiding who you were, I think it would have made the book a different book and I, th I think it wouldn't have been as effective. I think it's precisely because you are expressing your humanity in the book in all of its aspects that makes the book work so incredibly well. If we can get to the more painful, serious, if you like, side of things. Mm -hmm. These kind of historical events, if one thinks of Second World War, Nazi Germany, if one thinks of the Bosnian War, if one thinks of the genocide in Rwanda, there are certain questions, I think, that come to all of our minds. And for me, there are two basic questions that, that, that come up. The first one is, should we have seen it coming? And I think that you know, that's a question that has been asked recurringly, and certainly in, in Nazi Germany, should, one, should our families have left? Should we have known that it was coming? And you gave an interview in the Huffington Post, and you said in that interview, you didn't know when it was going to start. Now, I know I'm a lawyer, and I can be very painful as a lawyer, so, but am I overanalyzing that statement to say, I didn't know when it was going to start, that you knew something was going to start. You didn't know when. Or did it come as a, as a complete surprise to you? I know you were a, a teenager, you were a young boy. Mm -hmm. um, but did you have a sense that something like 1994 was coming? So, <coughs> this is in retrospect, yeah. looking back. Yeah. yeah. At the time, if, it, if you don't look in retrospect, at yeah. the time? At the time, there were indications that something is in the air. So I, I was mm. in boarding school. Yeah. I was in yeah. Utari. By the way, a city that you described so well in your book, Nyenzi. Yes. I, yeah. I, I uh, enjoyed reading that chapter where you described that city. And mm. you mentioned my school. <laughs> So it, well, I went to. so it turns out, yeah. yeah. Um, the, during, just before the, the genocide, some high profile politicians were killed. Mm. And one uh, uh, was killed in Butare. Mm. Uh, and it was an extremist. Uh, who had founded one of the political parties, the extremist uh, political parties. And the school locked, was locked down. There was a lockdown on the school, which, by the way, is a prestigious school. There's a lot of sport. There's a lot of freedom. But that day, there was this lockdown, and we could sense that this is a dangerous time to live in. Mm. But then it blew uh, off. It, mm. was, it didn't materialize into something. But the rumors were there are people who are being killed in the streets. And you know, he was killed in the streets by a mob. And that was true. Right? So th there were moments mm. that preceded the genocide that mm. you could sense that something could happen. Mm. But then it didn't happen. So we were on, on, on Easter holiday. I was at home in Kigali. Uh, the president was, in fact, coming from Tanzania mm. in the efforts to get the peace accords implemented mm. as they should. The United Nations had sent uh, armies uh, mm. uh, were, were, were there to do it, to, to, to oversee. The rebels had sent 600 soldiers in the city 
to protect their own politicians who will take part in the whole transition government. So there was a sense that the war is over, there were signs that we are now moving forward and it's behind us. Now, for, for my family particularly, we're excited because of Colonel Kanyarengwe that I refer mm. to in, mm. in, in the book, because mm. um, he was now the chairman of the RPF and, and we had a connection with my family. So there was some excitement. Uh, and then the, the, the presidential plan was shot. Mm. Uh, there were the president of Rwanda and the president of Burundi. That night, that's when everything changed. That hope evaporated. So, uh, had there been signs? Yes, for sure. Could one have told what would happen and the extent to mm. which it would happen? That part I am not sure. Mm. Because I was 13, it's, I cannot imagine that somebody would know that a 13 year old will one day wake up on school holiday and, and, and people he might know will be killing people he might know in the streets outside his home. And I don't think there is any, somebody who would know that's a possibility and let it happen. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. I cannot comprehend yeah. that it's possible. But after the plan was shot, that was the beginning of the, the three months of, of, of the horror. You say in, in the book, you hear on the radio that the plane has been shot down and there was this shocking announcement. Mm -hmm. And you say, I went to bed knowing something big had happened, but it was not yet clear what. Yeah. And you woke up to what we now know is the beginning of the Rwandan genocide. Yeah. Surprisingly, the first sign that something was different mm. was hearing my mother having a conversation with our neighbor so early in the morning. Mm. Uh, and I'm thinking, usually that's the time when my mother was a public servant. She would be getting ready to go to work. Yeah. Our neighbor never visited us at that hour of the morning. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, what, what are they talking about? Mm. And then it turned out that they were talking about the shooting of the plane. Mm. And, and I could sense the anxiety of what will then happen. Because mm. there was a sense that he was the one holding it all together. Yeah, and if he's yeah. not there, then what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the second question that I think comes to all of our minds when we deal with tragedies like this is what makes people do this? What makes one, yeah, what, what makes it possible? And if I can, rather strangely, not read from your book, but read from one of my books. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I can, you see. <laughs> um, so this is a book about the Rwandan genocide as well. And, and right at the end, after it's all over, um, the main female protagonist is, is, is walking. Um, and she's, she's in, the, in the field, walking with her child in Rwanda. And she says, an older man stands beside the road, leaning on a hoe. Selina nods towards him and he greets her. Where had he been, she wonders, looking at his worn face. Where had he been when the killings took place? Had he been one of them? Had he slaughtered and maimed? This man standing quietly on the side of the road. She looks into the fields at the men and women working there. Were they killers? What did they do when the genocide started? Does a killer look any different from anyone else? So my question to you is, you're having lived through it, your sense of that question, are we all capable of it? Are we all capable of atrocities put in the right or wrong circumstances? What's your sense of it, having seen it unfold? So, <clears throat> part of our human condition, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we, we, we make choices uh, from within, but there is a lot of factors outside of us that sometimes trigger either fear or frustration or whatever it is. And one of the things I'm learning is, unless we are aware of it and let it out or deal with it, it, it in some ways at an individual level, 
it's going to come out at the wrong time in the wrong way with the wrong people mm. and and sometimes in ways that we don't like and so if i put it in context uh when i look at the people that i i, I saw doing these things mm. who were they that's the only way i can answer the the question one of the people i talk about is this builder yeah who was in who was renovating our house i know him as a as a child because he taught me how to lay bricks he taught me and my brother how to to lay bricks and and play cards and he was very kind when i look at that group of builders who were in our house mm. this is the early 90s 1990 he was the kindest i would say then they completed their job and they left 1994 uh, he was part of a mob he was the only one with a gun he was the one who was going to kill people and i saw that it was him mm. the same fingers that taught me to lay bricks or the fingers pulling the trigger to kill the people and what had happened to him to put him f- to cause that transition there is there is one one thing i know one fact mm-hmm. is that he was from byumba which is north uh northeast of rwanda where the rebels first entered rwanda okay. Okay. and i know that he in the early 90s received many really disturbing news about what happened to his family what the rebels the rpf rebels did to his family uh, and and there's a lot of displaced people mm-hmm. in fact i remember seeing him before the genocide he was a different man you can tell mm-hmm. uh, when you look at him that he's in a lot of pain in, even in the way that he talks mm-hmm. now i don't want to infer or necessarily say that because of that pain then he became a killer there is still a long way to sure, go before way to go. before yeah. you 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 get to that point mm. but then if you look at the 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 militia that were doing it i i i talk about bully boys but i also don't necessarily say it's the bully boys who mm. became the killers mm. but the point is that the militia they had a little bit of excitement in them that it became exciting to do what they were doing mm. it became something to celebrate it became something to be part of and some of them adopted uh postures and the language of hollywood movies you know like mm. things that we because it was a mm. time when also we were having all these war movies and commando mm. and and and, and mm. rambo and mm. and in fact some of them took took on their names and in the name of defending the country mm. they went after the one they were told was the enemy mm. and songs that were sung at that time they were about doing the work yeah and so at some point it was not i am killing a fellow human being mm. at some point i am dealing with inyenzi yeah uh, inyenzi by the way is a cockroach mm. uh and so this dehumanization by the way uh, uh uh this is something that in south africa it's disturbing for me right yeah. me too because some of the politicians in south africa they don't realize the extent of the damage they are actually doing yeah. you know when the mec was talking to the zimbabwean woman mm. saying you know go back to you know the medical mm. things you are overcrowding she can justify what she's doing because she's not telling a lie but there's somebody out there who is going to hear it as mm. we need to deal with this and so mm. she's giving us a reason mm. to be militant mm. and look what happened now kalafong dudula yeah. and they are now going to go nationwide yeah. it is it the thing is and then somebody literally said i will disconnect the oxygen from from these these people mm. now i know that some people will think it's something that you just say but 
you are actually not far from justifying yeah. killing these people yeah. as a good thing to do for the country. Mm. Uh, and, and, and you are going to find that it's the politicians who do this who will then eventually start distancing themselves from the result mm. of what, you know, they will say, yeah. I, I didn't mean That's not that. what I meant. That's yeah. not what I meant. Yeah. But actually, it's, it's fueling it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that a lot of what made the killings possible in, in Rwanda was the dehumanization of victims. It, the, yes. And, what, what we, and one of the reasons I was asking you about did you see it coming is, you know, there's that rather awful analogy of a frog in hot water as the water gets slowly warm and the frog's completely happy. But yeah. put a frog in boiling water and it'll jump out. But the frog in warming water will stay until it's too late. And there's a, an extent to which that's the case in many of these situations. And, and there's that concern here too. Yeah. That are we on a kind of slippery slope where we are getting victims dehumanized and we're going to end up with something not dissimilar in this country. And I share your deep concerns about things like Operation Dudula and the, the, the terminology. They're not just words. No. And this is, uh, this is where I, s I sit back and think, you know, there's a, it's a phrase, they call it systems thinking. You know, yes. it's uh, when you start this is literally the business consultant talking. Here. Yeah, yes. this is it. <laughs> and and I wish there was more of that kind of thinking. Yeah. You know, before yeah. our people become politicians and before yeah. they become influential people, yeah. uh, because then you would see how actions you do today are going to affect people in two years' time. Um, yeah, let's get on to some of the sensitive side of what I want to ask you, um, and I'm and. One must take this seriously. Um, P was explaining to me that he's he's given up certain of his um, funding work um, that he was doing at the time because of concerns about the political reach of Paul Kagame's government. So it's not just something that is said in the air, mm. uh, but we're going to deal with some of the politics of, of Rwanda. Um, and you're welcome to ask your, the questions that you might have at the, at the end. The way you've dealt with it in the book, though, is very careful. And I enjoyed it. Because it's clear where you are coming from, what you are saying. But you didn't have the need to stand on a soapbox and, and shout it out. And one of the points that, uh, that I saw it was in your interaction with Nelson Mandela. So you met Madiba which was obviously an incredibly ex uh, special moment. But he takes you to one side and he says, so young man, I hear you are from Rwanda. You say, yes, Ntata, I'm from Rwanda, I replied. It was much easier answering his questions than figuring out what to say or ask. Please remind me, he said, who is the president of your country? Mm. You said, it's Paul Kagame, Ntate. <laughs> oh, it is still that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then yes. everyone bursts into laughter. And, yeah, and there's, there's Madiba getting the point too. Yeah. The narrative, the traditional narrative that we've all grown up with since 94 yeah. of the Rwandan situation is a Hutu-led genocide of Tutsi population. The country is saved by the RPF and Paul Kagame coming in from the north and rooting out the inter, inter Hamwe, mm -hmm. the genocidaires, and forcing them into submission and out of the country. He becomes the darling of the West. Rwanda is by far one of, it is by far the, the biggest African country in terms of aid, I think. But certainly in terms of its economy, it is, the majority of its economy is foreign aid. Um, and it is the, now the darling of the West in Africa. That's the, that's the narrative. Mm. And then we have someone like you who survived the genocide but left afterwards. Mm. Your reasons for leaving Rwanda after the, this, uh, the savior had taken over and, and saved your country from, its, from itself. Mm. <clears throat> you can answer it as subtly as you like. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that uh, for a long time, actually, I was 
was telling you, I, I yeah. have resisted this kind of question, but it's important. Uh, I lived seven years in Rwanda after the genocide, so my, my high school continued after genocide. In fact, I went to a school I should never have dared to go to mm -hmm. uh, because it was a school built after the genocide for the elite returnees who were coming back. Um, but that school also protected me in some ways. But it's after uh, arriving here and starting to interact, in fact, in the process of writing this book, that I realized while I was at that school, I was living a double life. There was the reality of my family and, and my, 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 uh, my home life. And then the school, when I got there, I was a completely different person. So much so that once I was having this conversation on, on, on radio here, John John Methan, mm -hmm. John Methan, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. and 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 one of my schoolmates uh, got hold of that um, a podcast mm. and shared it on a WhatsApp group. I actually write it, you know, yeah, all about in, in the book. book. Yeah. Shared it on a WhatsApp group and said the situation was precarious in, in, in 1998, in, in, in 2000. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, it actually dawned on me that it is true that they didn't know. Mm. Uh, so for the first time, I shared with my schoolmates the reality of my life in the late uh, 90s. 90s. Mm. Um, uh, my, my mother being held for five months without that charge or trial, my uncle literally disappearing for years, um, my, my brother, not just my brother, but many people who were killed in the north of Rwanda by the, by the government forces. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I know I, I talk about, because uh, I know this boy uh, um, is an adult now, but literally he was thrown, was a baby, was thrown against the wall and left for dead mm. after the mother was killed. Uh, and, 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 and the woman who go there, they buried the mother and took the baby and they raised the baby as their own. Mm. Um, now these things were happening in Rwanda in the late 90s, but there is a whole part of Rwanda that doesn't know that. Mm. Now, this is where I, 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 I know this because uh, people, I hear people saying, how can a white person here in South Africa say they didn't know what was happening under apartheid mm. and, and, and mm. you believe them? Actually, now I believe that mm. because you only know, sometimes you only know what they want you to know. So I just have the privilege, and I now call it a privilege to have lived in both worlds and, and now I can look at it and say, hang on a second, they didn't know. Mm. So no wonder if people in Rwanda don't know what's happening in Rwanda, how would people outside Can know what's idea. happening yeah. in Rwanda? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, uh, of course, I, I, I finished high school. My, 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 um, I, w I got a scholarship to go to Butare, to the university you talk about in the, your mm. book. Mm. Um, and then my mother just wouldn't stop asking me to go. Because before my brother was killed, he, she had done the same. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I resisted it for a couple of years. And eventually, I realized it was not just about me. Mm -hmm. It was about the family. Mm -hmm. And so I left. After having been given reassurance that in Tanzania things will go well, I will be helped to go to Canada and, and, and you know. Mm -hmm. so, so that's how I left. The plan was Canada or just about anywhere except South Africa. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> the definitely. only option I had ruled out completely was South Africa. Yeah. And here you are, sir. <laughs> Although it was an advanced economy, I'd been told many people chose as their destination. I'd also heard that the Zulu people, whom I thought to be all the black people in South Africa, didn't like other black people from the rest of Africa because they believed they were taking their jobs. I'd heard stories of them treating black immigrants really badly, mm. including beating them up in the streets. I feared the racism from the whites. 
and the fact that I didn't speak English made South African option an impossibility in my mind. Mm. And yet? And yet I'm here. <laughs> now, they'll put in the context about the racism from the whites, by mm. the way. I came down at a time when there was a scandal in the media about white South African policemen mm. who were training dogs on illegal mm. immigrants, mm. You know, black mm. people from mm. in, in the that. felt, and it was caught on camera. Mm. So um, one of the, I think, blessings I've had was that I, I was turned into a news junkie at mm. a very early age. Mm. So I read newspapers. At least even when I went into exile, I had this... FM, you know, shortwave and uh, medium wave receiver. So I would, I would get a lot of news from. Uh, so I heard it in the news, and I was thinking, oh my goodness! You don't want to be there. No, <laughs> especially because the first thing I'm going to become is an illegal immigrant <laughs> in South Africa. So, yeah. so, um, and and then of course the assumption that all black people are Zulu in South Africa. Mm. People don't realize how popular the word Zulu is outside of South Africa. Probably next to Nelson Mandela, that's, <laughs> that's the second biggest. Mm -hmm. And of course, the ignorance about the diversity that is, that sure. is here. Sure. Um, and so, uh, by then I arrived in KwaZulu-Natal and, and my first friends were Zulu. Um, mm. And uh, some of the people some have been were nice. so <laughs> <laughs> no. So it was, it was just, it was just the other othering, you know, the yeah. other assumption and judging that is uh, common, I, I, I hate to say. And you survived in the beginning as a car god. Yeah. And you, you don't deal with it in, in, in great length, but the little detail that you give is absolutely chilling. You it's say, her fault. <laughs> <laughs> you say that there were various reactions from motorists. A, shoe, a few would have a short conversation which felt like a gift. Most avoided engaging with me, while others actually insulted me. When insulted or treated dismissively, I longed to tell them that I'd been a university student. Back home, that carried some status. I even had an income from bursary allowances, which had begun to feel like a salary. Mm. From that to being dismissed, or being pitied by motorists who gave me leftovers from a restaurant. It was hard, but I adjusted quickly and reminded myself it was a means to an end. Mm. Just tell us a little bit about that experience of yeah, going from a student at a prestigious school, from a family that was had ties, you know, respected, mm -hmm. to working as a car guard and outside. I think it was outside a sports stadium some of the time that you were working or a restaurant. Yeah, it was actually. I think it's one of the decisions I'm so proud of in my life is that I very quickly realized that it was a it was a trap to become a car guard with your place. Because it's a, it's a territorial activity. You have to be there. You have to guard the place. Mm. And I realized that if I do that, then I will not have time to deal with home affairs, which uh, I still needed to get my papers. Mm. And I will surely not have time to mm. deal with the universities. Mm. So I became the roaming car guard. You know, I was the one trusted to look after other car guards' places mm. when they had errands to run. Um, and so I, I, I go to, uh, and then on weekends, especially when the spring boss came in town, we went to the King's Park, King, King's King's Park, Park Stadium, stadium yeah, yeah. outside. Yeah. The further away you are from the stadium, the more money you get, you know, because people then think you did a good job. Um, <laughs> uh, but I remember there was a, a spring box, France. There was a mm. game, and, uh, mm. and uh, I, was, I was a car guard outside the stadium. And then I go to watch cars outside of the University of Natal uh, uh, for students. So, you know what humbled me is that very quickly I found decent families uh, where the, f the husband and, and, and the wife, they were both car guards, but in the evening they are as decent as I remember back home. They send their children to school, to primary yeah. school. Yeah. And, and they, had a, they had kept a, the, the dignity that, that, mm. I, that I, could, I could associate with because mm. I know. Now, now they were nurses and, and accountants and engineers and, and former politicians and army officers. Yeah. And these are people of status in my country who were car guards. Mm. 
And so very quickly, I was humbled mm -hmm. uh, and inspired. Uh, and I think uh, there are so many who have many stories to tell. Uh, and so, but I knew I'm there for, for a time and I will get out of it. But the one thing that helped me the most was to make a decision to stay in South Africa. Because you, mm. many people don't realize that many of these migrants, they come here, especially those who come from Rwanda, Congo. South Africa is a stepping stone to somewhere else. Mm. And so many of them are in transit. And I know uh, those who are still in transit today, and it's been 21 years, uh, they are Stuck. still waiting for an opportunity to make enough money to mm. pay off somebody at the airport and get fake papers and mm. go to Europe. It's a stepping stone. I know that because it was also my intention. But when I saw that if you go to university here, you can literally, after, with the, after you mm. get a degree, you can do mm. anything. You can go anywhere you want because they are mm. as good as you know, degrees from anywhere. I decided to stay. That was a decision that changed my life for a long time. I mean, I got to go to Europe and, and, mm. and see the refugees there. I got to go to America. I got to go to the places that I wanted to go to, and I still chose to come back to South Africa. Mm. You, in your acknowledgments, you, you thank South Africa for hosting you. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, mm. I, 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 there are so many reasons why I still would choose South Africa. Mm. Uh, and now, of course, I, you know, sometimes I, I look at the news and I, <laughs> I hear we, things and I'm trust thinking... Trust me, we all feel that. You know, yeah. uh, but um, I, I'm still here. We know that you, 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 know, you suffer from PTSD, from one of the worst experiences in the world, but everyone in this room, I promise you, has one of the worst PTSDs. It's called home affairs. Yeah. And if you've been dealt with South African home affairs, you're never quite the same person ever again. And you know that better than anyone. But... <laughs> One of the things that, I, it's in fact a question that I've, I've written down for myself when I was reading your book is exactly the point you've touched on now. Mm. One of the things that worried me in your story was the extent to which your success was a question of luck mm. and how many other P. Pasifiques are sitting out there still, as you say, 21 years later, guarding cars. Mm. And how do we... What do we make of, how do we deal with that? How do you deal with that? Is it luck? Was it luck in your case? Well, <coughs> so th there is a part of it that is oh, luck, you know, mm. because for example, by the way, I, I say witnessing because I don't only want people to witness the horrors and the, and the genocide, which, which is something to witness, sure. but I also would like people to witness the, the the people who changed my life in that way, and, and that's where the part of luck comes in. Mm. So I remember fighting with the University of Natal to get in. Uh, I went all the way to the director of student funding, mm. said no, they sent me to fight the university finance department, no. I remember carrying a note from one end of the university to another, literally saying, this has never happened. Please it, it, um, uh, consider other ways because it's mm. not going to happen. Mm. And uh, now I know it was a dream-crushing note that I was carrying. You know, mm. so I remember the, the the lucky part is when Mr. Wills, the dean of student services, says, "You have a point. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you actually have a point." Mm. Because we, our policy doesn't deal with you. We deal with international students, you are not one. We deal with uh, 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 citizens, you are not one. Mm. So he saw the gap and he promised me to go to the council. But this is the part that is not luck. I had to get to his office. Uh, and and I, I know because there were a very good likelihood of me abandoning it because by the time I got to his office, lectures had started and I was still a car guard. I had to pay rent and I had to attend classes. You know, in fact, one of my conversations with him later on is, if you don't get me into student residence now, I'm going to drop out. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and he actually laughed at that, uh, um, at my assertion, I want to say. And then gave you a reason. And then gave me a reason. <laughs> right. yeah. so, so tenacity has got a lot to do with it. So that, that is the lucky part is there is this individual called, you yeah. know, Trevor Wills. And he sees you and for who you are. And he sees me yeah. for who I am. Yeah. But the, there is a, I, I, you have to get there. Mm. You have to do something. And you have to push. And you have to push. And this yeah. is you know, part of my work now is I'm telling them, stop being in transit. This is home. And, and live accordingly, you will see what will happen. Here we're going to run out of time soon, but I just want to move to the question of healing. Yeah. The question of overcoming the tragedy. Watching people kill each other or staring at a hand on the back of a dead body were not things a child should have to witness. No matter who eventually won the war, these memories would remain. The souls of young witnesses like me would be scarred, probably for life. And the future of many children, like those beside me as we stared at men doing unspeakable deeds, would certainly be profoundly affected. All as a result of a war that someone one day would one day claim to have won. But how could there be a winner? How could a war causing so much physical, emotional, and spiritual destruction, tainting the innocence of children, and making men, good and bad alike, kill fellow men, produce a winner? Hmm. For, you, for you personally, I know that after the, the genocide, and as a young man, after what you'd witnessed, you joined a seminary for a while in Uganda, and that burnt down, and in fact, many of your fellow colleagues perished. And when I read that part in the book, having read the whole trauma of the genocide, and then seeing you reach out to God and the seminary burns to the ground, where's God for you in, in this? Yeah. Do you still have a God in this? Yeah, so, <clears throat> well, it was the dream of seminary that burnt down. It's mm. the whole uh, group, the mm. whole movement that mm. burned down, mm. and with it, of course, it was the whole promise: I will go to seminary. Mm. Um, uh, uh, that at that moment, that's when I decided that there can't be God in the way I have been taught. Uh, God, that, the, that mm. this God cannot be, exist, because mm. the God of good, the God that saves, the God that loves, the God cannot be. Because the people who burnt down in that church, I had sung with them, I had prayed with them, I had worshipped with them, and for God to do that to them. Mm. And then I went back to my, my Rwandan experience. Mm. Um, it was here in South Africa when I embarked on this journey of healing uh, that I realized in that too is God. Mm. Uh, it's because I had this fixed idea of what and who God is that when I was met with the complete opposite, I rejected God. Mm. Uh, but when I let go of my attachment to what God should be, then I find God in every place that I have lived through. Mm. Uh, uh, and and uh, it took me a long time to be able to say this, but at some point, I revisited some of the memories and I saw something beautiful, mm. however small, mm. in the scenes that I have witnessed. Uh, and uh, I, I saw, for example, a militiaman, one of those in Nerahamge, saving a child. Now, the way he did it was so violent mm. that it just blended in with that violence. It's only afterwards that I realized I saw that child's family being killed and that child was not there. Now, I don't know if this child survived. Mm. But I remember this man saying, what is this thing doing here? And shook the child and took him away. And I remember meeting him moments after without that child. Mm. 
now, sometimes I sit and I'm thinking, I saw that. What do I do with it? What led this man not let this whole scene unfold and let the child be shot by, by mm. the militiamen like he was shooting these people? Because he could have. Mm. Uh, and in, 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 a, in a sense, I feel so privileged that I witnessed that, mm. even though I don't know what to do with it. Mm. You know, the, 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 the man I saw being killed in, from the church, there is an altercation that I witnessed. Mm. Later on, I learned that one of the men from the church was not Tutsi, he was a Hutu man. And the militia literally argued with him, wanting him to get out of the group so they can kill him. Mm. He said, I won't won't go. So when I was writing the book, I went back to people who went to that church and I said, who is this man? And they told me his name. Mm. I don't know his surname. His name is Abel. Right? Now, I know. I'm thinking Abel should be spoken about. Mm. Abel was killed with his fellow church men mm. there. He, all he needed to do was to take a step and get out of that group, and he didn't. Now, I was there. Mm -hmm. It was the same scene where I witnessed this woman asking her brother who was killing people to go and finish the agony of a man they only had hurt but not killed. Mm -hmm. And she cried asking him, please go and finish him off, please. Mm. Now I heard her words and moments later he was, he was killed. Mm. Now this is me hearing somebody saying, please go and, and kill him. Now it's absurd that those are the words, but I was there and I know the context in mm. which those words were said. Mm. And I'm thinking, what is it that led her to appeal to her brother so for mm. such an act of compassion? Mm. So the more, this is for me, I think the privilege that I've had is the more I, I, I engage with the healing, mm. the more I realize Maybe if I open my eyes, I'm going to see God. If I don't attach, uh, or, or if I don't remain attached to who God should be A and what God image. should yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, is God in those militia men? My answer is yes. Tough answer, but yeah. It's a tough answer. Yeah. Is God in those people who were, I witnessed somebody being killed and I heard his last words and his last words were, oh my God, in my language, man, I and away. I will never forget this man. And, and was God there? My interpretation was God has abandoned this man. Because mm. the last thing he did was a call mm. to God. Mm. And the, the event that I write about, one of the, the, the really intense processing moments that I had was where I got to meet him again and met the soldier who shot him. Mm. And, and for both, I could feel the same thing. Mm. Their presence. And, and I think the, the point of healing in the book that is so strong is that point where yeah. you, you, at, the, at the beginning of our conversation, you were talking about it, you were lying on the, on the ground. Mm sweating and crying and shouting no and and revisiting that image of that murder and each time shouting no mm -hmm. and eventually saying yes and at yes. that point i suppose it's an acceptance or an understanding what what is that yes that then allows you to heal so many years later uh, so there is a yes to it is 
as mm. it is, it actually did happen mm. because because the no was this shouldn't be happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's this tension about this shouldn't be happening and yet I know it has happened mm. that actually uh, changes the makeup of who I am because then I'm, 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 I'm a human being denying reality mm. in, 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 in the way I am. Mm. And, and when I released that and I said, okay, yes, I can actually say yes to this. Mm. The freedom that I felt, it's, it's, it's something I wish every human being would experience at least once in their, mm. in their life, mm. to say yes to life as it is. Uh, and so when we say, and this is where for me then, it becomes to say yes to God. Mm. Now, uh, uh, this is, was actually my anxiety was because I removed that chapter quite a few times from ah, the book, okay. thinking, uh, you know, th this is going to be misunderstood. There's yeah. no way I can have the right words to say what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, but uh, but it's 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 not for for me to 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 say. I'm just going to say what my experience was, mm. and and then I will see. And for, for all of us to take it and, and make of it what, it, what we will. Exactly. And for you to trust us. I, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I've been very selfish, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very sorry, but I'm too far too engaged in my conversation <laughs> with you to let you ask any questions. But you've got three minutes if anybody would like. Oh, there are lots of hands going up. You're going to have to come and talk to Pete afterwards. But the gentleman over here. Um, I'm sorry, I'd normally um, pass my question over, but I'm working for News 24, so I have to <laughs> ask a question. Um, I find that you said uh, you po postponed the, the writing of the book for years and years. When you did sit down to write it, what was your process in terms of, like, you must have anticipated that PTSD triggering so many things would come back whilst trying to write it. And I'm sure you did experience that, but did you, like, you know, talk to a therapist and kind of engage someone in their process, or, or was there a way in which you, the time had just gone on, you know, since to detach yourself enough to write it? Or what would you advise to other writers who want to um, record their trauma or, or write this kind of book, you know? <clears throat> so, so I, I have to mention this because it's really important because people say you must write your stories, you must tell your stories, mm. but writing is a privilege that not many people actually have mm. because for a long time, actually, one of the major reasons why I didn't write is because I didn't have the time to do that because life was happening. You know, I needed to take care of my family back home, I needed to earn a salary, I needed to keep working, right? So the time to, 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 to write... Uh, didn't come until Jules Newton, bless her. Um, I worked in her company. She taught me, well, I made enough money. They didn't pay me all at once. And I saw the opportunity. They would pay me a little bit every month and I wouldn't have to worry about it, about income, right? So that was the first, first thing because it takes time. And even though, even when I took that sabbatical and I stopped and decided to write, I thought I will leave on Friday and Monday I will start writing. It took four months mm. before I wrote the first words on, 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 mm. on, on paper. Uh, and, and so, uh, and then I got attached to a way or a place or a, you know, like, because uh, I, I had this idea of what a healing process or writing for healing should look like. And none of them worked. Um, uh, it's then until I said, you know what, maybe I shouldn't write a book, I should just write a journal. And that's how it started. Mm. But uh, I have to mention two um, uh, things. One is the first time I ever told my story to other people uh, at a, an AVP uh, uh, workshop, Alternatives to Violence uh, Project. Uh, it was the first time that I felt I am worthy. With my story, I am worthy. And that was important for me. And then I did other uh, uh, life skills training programs, including one called More to Life. Some of you would know. Uh, uh, 
I see Mandy. Is that Mandy? Yeah, yeah, you would, you would know. Um, uh, they, they, they taught me a, a lot of the processing that, that I went through. Right? And then there was therapy. For, for at the University of Natal, I was known as the child of the science, uh, child of the student counseling center. Because that's literally, that, that's what I was. So I would go there every single week I was in therapy. Now, does it have to be that elaborate? My answer, honestly, is no. If you find the right people around you, the right context, it actually doesn't have to be. And yet, uh, um, it's necessary. It is necessary to have that. And writing, for me, is the same as having a conversation with someone else. And then, when I redid, redid it, it got to a point where I looked forward to doing it so that I can mm. see what I'm going mm. to discover. Mm. 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 Uh, and, and so, uh, but, but the actual book, I literally had to let go of the need to find the right words and the need to find the right English. And, and then, uh, and, and that's when it started flowing. And then uh, uh, the publisher, uh, Quela and B Publishers, they found, they found worth in the book and they, they gave me absolutely the most amazing editor, Gillian. Uh, it's so all about the editor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she was caring, she was holding, she was, you know. So, so for me, I think it starts with the yes, I'm going to do it. Mm. But the how is yeah. going to be different for everybody. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, we are out of time. Please, <laughs> would you join me and P? Thank you. Thank you. We're, going, we're going to go next door to where the books are sold. Um, I think I might get myself a glass of wine on the way. I'm hoping that P will too. Come and continue the conversation. Come and chat and come and buy his book, please. Thank you very much for being here.